I just got to stay put, I think. Okay, I gotcha. Thanks. Let me know if there's anything you need. No, it's just my usual. I lost the sound. Stuff you live with, you know? Oh. Thank you anyway. I've lost the sound. You know what? What did you touch? Nothing. <laughs> they, they muted you. Hi, Wayne. Hi, Carol. Okay. Hello. Hello, Jeff. Matt. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hello, Dorinda. Hi, Hi, Caroline. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. I forgot the time change today. Hi, Maureen. Good. Oh, boy. <laughs> By my clock, we are about time. Yeah. So I welcome you to this uh, virtual meeting of First Baptist Church. Uh, <clears throat> glad you could be here. Thank you for the sunshine, God. And uh, let's greet one another with our mics muted, of course. The Lord is with you. And also yes, with so you. you. Pastor Diana has our opportunities for ministry this morning. Good morning. Uh, it's actually a relatively quiet week. This uh, there are no. We have a board meeting this afternoon um, at twelve thirty. Um, some of us will be here. Some of us will be online. This will be kind of a test to see if the hybrid system works well, uh, because we're hoping that next Sunday. Uh, for our quarterly business meeting that we'll be able to have a Some can be at home on Zoom and we'll all be able to hear and see each other. I would encourage you to, whether it's on Zoom or in person, to join us next Sunday at 1230 um, as we continue our conversation about the future at our quarterly business meeting. Also on Wednesday evening this week, we will have at seven o'clock on Zoom, our regular connection time. Um, I now believe that Harriet has a mission moment. I do indeed. Um, we, I have some memory issues. I don't know if anybody else is having that experience, but <laughs> no, I forget things. The other day I put the sugar bowl in the refrigerator. And so I have a memory quiz for you this morning. You will see on the slide in front of you something. Can you remember what those pictures were from? Anybody? Just wave if you know what that was. Okay, there's a few. Yeah. Last fall we gathered a um, collection point yeah, for hay hygiene kits um, like we've been doing for many years to be delivered to hay school in the spring and we thought since we were socially distanced and not able to meet in person that we would uh, instead of uh, having you bring a different item each month that we would ask people to bring all the items in this drive and we had in mind that we would have to go again in the spring and have another one in order to come up with enough items to fill our quota. And guess what? In one drive, we believe we were able to collect all we needed for the entire year. You stepped up so faithfully. So I'm here this morning to remind you and tell you that what we're going to do with those things, because all those hygiene items have been in storage in the church building in the old preschool room. And next Sunday, when you may be able to gather in person for the quarterly business meeting, for those who are able to come to the business meeting, we are going to have set up an assembly line to put all those products in bags and deliver them the next day to Hay School. So we'll have things set up before the meeting and we'll gather a little bit. If we don't get them all assembled before the meeting, we'll finish it up after the meeting. I applaud you for your faithful efforts in this. And because Hay School is going to be closing next year, we will be looking for other opportunities of ministry to 
um, replace that effort. So thank you. And I look forward to seeing many of you next Sunday afternoon and the rest of you on Zoom. Love you all. As we prepare for worship, and thanks, Harriet, um, I invite you to listen to these centering words. How do we lead lives worthy of our calling? How do we show the grace we have received? By conducting ourselves with humility, gentleness, patience, and love. By living as one body, one spirit, by building ourselves up in love. If you are muted, if you are playing, we cannot hear you. Chris, you are muted. We did not hear you. Thank you. Sorry. How was that? That's good. This is Let There Be a Voice in the Same. This is our call to worship this morning. And thanks, Chris. There is one body, one spirit, one Lord of all. We are one body in Christ, bound together in holy love. There is one hope, one faith, one Father of all. We are one family of God blessed with gifts of one spirit. There is one baptism, one true home, one mother of all. We are one people nourished by God with the food of eternal life. Come, Come let, us, let worship. us worship. 
Please join me with your mics muted as we sing our Lenten opener, My Tribute. We'll sing it through two times. To God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God be the glory for the things he has done. With his blood he has saved me, with his power he has raised me. To God be the glory for the things he has done to god be the glory to god be the glory to god be the glory for the things he has done with his blood he has saved me with his power he has raised me to god be the glory for the things he has done. Will you, join, will you join with me with your mics muted for the unison invocation? And we'll follow that with the Lord's Prayer. You create us to be one people, O God, one with you and one with one another and one in humility and gentleness with the world. Transform our spirits and open our hearts that we may hear your call and live in the fullness of Christ. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading for today is taken from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive, and he gave gifts to his people. And when it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints of the work for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and to the end of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knitted together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. I invite you to think about um, how
how difficult, how much more difficult it is to keep our money flow up to cover our expenses when we are apart like this. And I encourage you to continue to share, whether by um, mail check or through a bank draft of some sort or an, an arrangement with your bank to share with us directly or um, through your credit card, however you do that, to consider continuing your giving. Will you join with me uh, in prayer? For calling us into ministry with you, we give you thanks and praise, O oh God, for gracing us with gifts and with abundance. We are always grateful. Bless these gifts which we plan to give and have given. We dedicate them to you that they may nourish others with the grace of your presence. In gratitude, we pray always. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Okay, those of you who are children or not, um, today during connection time, we're going to talk about uh, the what what Ephesians calls the body of Christ, which is a congregation, the church, and uh, we're going to compare it to a machine, a machine with many parts, because really the church has many people, and each of them is a part. So. Um, Diana, would you please advance it one? Um, back it up. Oh, never mind. <laughs> what is it? What is it that we're looking at? Parts of what? Bike. Bike. Sure. All, all of you know what a bike is. And look at all those parts. And there are many more in a bike. That's not the only, well, those aren't the only parts by any means. But think about if that bike, those bike parts, if one of them was missing, you'd really have a hard time riding the bike. That first thing you saw, the circle thing in the middle, the sprocket, that's what makes the, well, that's what your pedals makes turn, it makes them turn that sprocket, and that makes the chain go, which turns the wheel, the back wheel, which makes you go forward. You got to have all those parts. You could ride a while without a seat, but you wouldn't want to ride a long ways. Um, there's a lot of things about a bike and about its parts. Each one of them is important. And Ephesians says that in the church, each person is important. We have been given special gifts by God. And, you, and that doesn't just mean you can sing really good or a good artist or a good carpenter or something like that. It means that you have something that helps other people in the church. Maybe it's just that you're a friendly person. Maybe it is that you are helpful. Maybe, maybe it's your smile. There are many ways that each of us is a part of the church and help, we help each other to grow in Christ. We can help each other to grow in love. And it's good to know that each of us, kids, grownups, everybody, has a very important part in the church, just like each of these parts have to do with the bike. And Diana, one more. We have a whole bike. And in the next picture, you're going to see the whole congregation because during prayers of the people, that's what we have. Thank you, God, 
Thank you that we have each other and that we can help each other grow in your love. Amen. All right. So uh, this morning <clears throat> at this time, we do come as that body together, all of those pieces working together. And one of the ways that we do that is to pray for one another and to pray with one another. So um, how could I invite you to um, offer your prayer requests and praises this morning? I have a praise if no one else is speaking. Um, I just want to pray a Thanksgiving um, for my residents who are now able to have family members visit. And it's just been such a positive thing. Um, and then um, just continued prayers. I'm going to be picking up a bunch of shifts. If you could pray for me just for strength and endurance mostly. Um, and then finally, for my friend Amy, still battling cancer, and now she's having some issues with some infections, so she can really use our prayers. All right, Ed, I think I saw your hand at one point. You are muted. You need to unmute. No. Picture went away, but you're still muted. We'll come back. Is there anybody? Go ahead, Ed, if you, you're still muted. There Bob. we go. There we go. All right, Ed, go ahead. Just keep in prayer. I'm going to be the pastor and hopefully Okay. That was very broken, but I'm assuming that you were asking for prayer for Sandy as she continues her doctor's appointments and, and figuring out what they're going to do. All right, Bob. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, ask you to continue to pray for um, uh, Torben and Juliana um, Kruger in Germany, the, the, the family that lost the baby. Um, I've been called for jury duty, too, and I've been through this uh, once before, assuming that I'm selected for a trial. Um, and it's a very demanding kind of thing. I would appreciate your prayer for me if uh, if I'm selected. Um, and also that everybody remain safe from the possibility of passing on COVID, of course. Uh, appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Harriet. Um, I have been praying um, for our friends, Ron and Marilyn Newsom. Um, I don't think they would mind us mentioning their names. Uh, they are... Um, at least able to spend some time together now because of the, um, the restrictions being lifted a little bit where Marilyn is, but uh, I think of them often. Yeah. Sarah. Um, I am starting school this week with hope. We have all of our students back in all five days. Wow. So, and we are very excited about that and are all skeptical that it will last very long because mm -hmm. Easter's coming. Um, but we are excited about being able to try and get some continuity um, for the whole week rather than losing any time. Right. Yes. Right. All right. The teachers and students alike, those prayers need to be lifted. Uh, and parents. Parents have been sooner than the teachers. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Then let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you for this body. This body that is your body. This body of which we are all a part that we help to grow, that we help to mature, that we help to move and be a presence in the world. God, you invite us to pray with one another, to pray for one another. You invite us to come before your throne and offer both our 
struggles and our celebrations. And so we do come this morning, God, praying uh, for those who are struggling with health issues. We pray for Sandy and for Barb and for Mike. Uh, we pray for Amy. Um, we pray for the Newsoms. We also pray, God, for Mo and all of the healthcare workers who are going to be taking and continue to take care of those who are ill and struggling. We pray for those who are grieving, such as Bob's friends, Torvin and his family in uh, Germany. We pray for Bob as he goes for jury duty, that you would protect his spirit. Um, if he gets, as he goes to serve in this way. We pray especially for Sarah and the students and parents and families and teachers and administrators and her school system as they come back this week together. But God, we also pray for all of the teachers and students and parents um, in all of the schools around our country and around the world who are trying to figure out what school looks like in this time and this place. God, we pray for our congregation that you would show us how to be the strongest, healthiest body that we can be so that we might serve you and your purposes and your kingdom. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. We are God's people, and the song we are going to sing this morning has that title, We Are God's People. Are God's people, the chosen of the Lord. Born of his spirit, established by his word. Our cornerstone is Christ alone, and strong in him we stand. Oh, let us live transparently and walk heart to heart and hand in hand. We are the body of which the Lord is head, called to obey him, now risen from the dead. He wills us be a family, diverse yet truly one. Oh, let us give our gifts to God, and so shall his work on earth be done. We are a temple, the Spirit's dwelling place, formed in great weakness, our cup to hold God's grace. We die alone, for on its own each ember loses fire, yet Joined in one, the flame burns on to give warmth and light and to inspire. Our second scripture reading today is from Ephesians 4, verses 17 through 32. Now this I affirm and insist on in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles live in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance and hardness of heart. They have lost all sensitivity and have abandoned themselves to licentiousness, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. 
that is not the way you learned Christ. For surely you have heard about him and were taught in him as truth is in Jesus. You were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Good morning. So this week, we continue our Lenten sermon series on the letter to the Ephesians. Um, a letter I invited you to read as if it were written to us, uh, written with love to the saints in South Bend, Indiana. I've asked you to continue reflecting on a particular set of questions. God, what do you want to reveal to us? What do you want us to hear and learn from this letter? What does it mean to be the body of our Lord Jesus Christ here and now? Over the last few weeks, the author of Ephesians has reminded us that God has provided hope and abundance of riches and resurrection power to the church through Christ. We've celebrated that our salvation isn't dependent on us or our righteousness. In fact, God saved us while we were dead in our sin, which means that all of us stand on equal footing before God. Our salvation comes from God's grace alone, through God's resurrection and reconciliation power at work in Christ. And last week, we experienced the reality of being rooted and grounded in the love of God. We have heard the promises. Because of love, God has saved us by grace through Christ. God has created us for good works, gifted us with the Spirit, and grounded us in love. Therefore. That's how chapter four begins. This is kind of the hinge of the book, uh, the pivot from what God has done through Christ for us to how we are called to live in response. And Paul says that we are to live a life worthy of the calling to which we have been called. So what does that mean? What is the call to which we have been called? Paul V. Marshall, in Feasting on the Words, says that it is the ongoing reconciliation of all humanity to God and each other in Christ, into whom we ceaselessly grow. In order for that ultimate goal to be accomplished, however, the Apostle Paul calls us to two supporting goals to grow up into Christ and to build up the body of Christ. In the call for us to grow up into Christ, Christ becomes the measuring stick for our maturity in Christ. Now, that may seem impossible, but again, our maturity doesn't depend on just us. Christ is both the fulfillment of our maturity and the one who enables us to grow in maturity. We journey toward Christ, as we journey with Christ, writes G. Porter Taylor. The church, which is the body of Christ, 
is tasked with sharing God's message of ultimate reconciliation with the world. So in building up the body of Christ, we are furthering God's call for reconciliation. By modeling reconciliation in the body, we provide an example and model for reconciliation to the world. And again, it doesn't depend on us. The growth of the church into Christ is God's gift and promise. Both we as individual believers and the church are still growing toward maturity. We are pilgrims on the way, and this is a lifelong journey. Martin Luther put it this way, this life, therefore, is not godliness, but the process of becoming godly. Not health, but getting well. Not being, but becoming. Not rest, but exercise. We are not now what we shall be, but we are on the way. The process is not yet finished, but it is actively going on. This is not the goal, but it is the right road. At present, everything does not gleam and sparkle, but everything is being cleansed. And these calls are related because we most fully become our true Christ-like selves in relation to one another. And as each believer matures, the body as a whole becomes stronger. Taylor writes again, as a follower of Jesus aligns his or her life with God's purposes, he or she grows into becoming a disciple. And this individual transformation aids in the corporate transformation of the world into the kingdom. Christ's body is that place at the intersection of divine and human life where sovereignty, brokenness, and community are held together in God's grace. But this life within God's grace has always been God's plan. God chose us before the creation of the world we read in chapter one. Our life is worthy of our calling, writes Brian Patterson on the Working Preacher website, not because we can ever deserve such ever overflowing grace, but because such grace both calls for and calls forth a life that is in line with God's intent for all creation. Part of that reconciliation and growing up is understanding that the church is both one and many. The body of Christ is called to both unity and diversity. First, the church is one called to unity. Paul says that there is one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all. He lists seven points of unity. And in Jewish writing, seven is a perfect number, a number of completion. We are to be perfectly unified. Creation was completed in seven days. In other phrases in this passage, Paul speaks of the unity of the spirit, the unity of faith, the whole body. He says that we are members of one another and that God is above all and through all and in all. The unity is not a new theme in the book of Ephesians, where we have read of God's desire to gather up all things of God breaking down dividing walls and creating one new humanity. This unity, though, is a gift, not something that we produce. The worthy life merely nurtures that unity that already exists in the church. It's a call to maintain the unity given by the Spirit. Brian Peterson continues, we are held by the calling of God. We are given to one another in the spirit, and we are united in the Lord who is the head of the whole body. The church is a community where everyone is worthy of God's abundance, where all members are essential and connected and valued and loved. But unity is not uniformity. Uniformity often comes about through 
control. When those in power use fear to pressure others to conform to their image of what should be. No sooner has Paul declared the oneness of the church than he launches into a proclamation of the many, the many graces and gifts bestowed on believers in Christ. These multitudinous gifts were given by Christ to each and every believer. There is a diversity of gifts but a common purpose. These gifts are given to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Does that sound familiar? These gifts are given for forming mature disciples who reflect the full stature of Christ, who grow up in every way into Christ from whom the whole body joined and knitted together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love, writes Paul. God's church and God's world need people with different gifts in order for Christ's body to function in a healthy way. Our job is to recognize our particular gifts and to use them. Not to worry about what gifts we don't have, not to worry about how others are using their gifts, not to be jealous of the gifts we don't have. We can't do everything and we shouldn't try. We don't need to compete with others and their gifts. We only need to use the ones that God has given us. We are able to be a new community based not on the divisions inherent in the existing social order, but on the new humanity in Christ, writes G. Porter Taylor. And there's the challenge. Because we live in a world of division, a world of silos and echo chambers, on social media and even in our churches. We listen to those who think like we do. We worship with those who believe like we do. Are there any of God's children with whom we refuse to work and worship? Have you ever been a victim of that kind of exclusion? Have you ever victimized others with exclusion from the body by your words or your actions? What about by your, in your inner thoughts and attitudes? John and I had a conversation last week that you know, it's really easy in some ways to do the things that we're supposed to do, but it's a good thing we can't read each other's minds because sometimes the thoughts and attitudes that we hold inside um, shouldn't be shared and known by others. Have you ever believed that someone else was beyond the reach of God's grace? Maybe your Hindu neighbor or the congregation down the street, or maybe even your brother or sister in the next pew. We need to acknowledge our participation in these systems of division and shine a light on the powers that perpetuate them. Sometimes we need to speak the truth to those powers and systems, sometimes even to each other. But truth must always be spoken in love. Truth and love are symbiotic. They need to work together. Believers must neither thrive on conflict nor avoid it, if necessary, to expose truth. Truth is in Jesus. So to speak the truth in love is to draw near to the source of both truth and love. The church's call is to hold open spaces of grace where diversity in gifts, in life, and in practice are honored. And that can be hard. So now we know why Paul calls us to bear with one another in love. Bearing with one another in love is necessary 
because God has not only given the church a fundamental unity, but also a rich diversity of members. God's goal is the reconciliation of the whole creation in Christ. Our differences are not meant to be divisions. Unity in the midst of diversity means encountering and learning to love people who differ from us, especially in the church. The Greek word for forbear means to bear with, to endure, to put up with. Its connotation is to bear something, uh, to bear something unpleasant, even perhaps persecution, writes one scholar. That scholar goes on, isn't that what we all do in every congregation we've been a part of? We are all drawn to some folks, find most interesting, and wish a few could be changed more or less radically. We bear the last as much as we enjoy them. And of course, if we happen to think on it, we hope that for others, we are in the first or second group and not the third, without usually thinking on how much others have to bear with us. Love is the glue that holds the community together. It's what knits the body together. It's what allows us to sacrifice for one another, to help carry the burdens of the other, even the other who is so very different from us. Love is not just an emotion. Love is an act of the will. Unity is not just something we passively accept or reject. It's something we choose to do again and again and again and again. We live a life worthy of our calling as we embrace both our unity and our diversity, as we bear with one another in love, building up the body of Christ. Advancement of unity, love, and maturity in the midst of diversity supports the church's ultimate goal of growth into Christ. May we live as a body that is one and yet many. And may we grow into Christ, who is the head. Amen. Please join me in singing The Bond of Love, hymn number 696. Please unmute your mics. We are one in the bond of love. We are one in the bond of love. We have joined our spirit with the spirit of God. We are one in the bond of love. Let us sing now, everyone. Let us feel his love be let us join our hands so the world will know we are one in the bond of love. I invite you now to receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may we live into the reality of being the one and many of Christ's body. Amen. All right. I would invite John to take us off Facebook. Um,